God is so good. Well, the Lord put it on my heart to, to talk to you today, to share with you today about the Father of mercies. Um, because he gets a bad rap in a lot of places. Here he does it. When we talk about God here, we, we express the character of God. God is love. God is mercy. God is everything that the Bible says that he is. And when Jesus came down the earth and you know, he bore our, our punishment and bore the wrath of God on him, we can walk in, you know, in the mercy of God, in the, the love of God, in the goodness of God. So a lot of times people don't, don't know, really get to understand our picture of God, a, a real correct one. I mean, I've been in services where the, the minister, or I've even seen some on the internet, where the minister, he, he paints a picture of God as being just angry at everybody. And, you know, he might wake up on the wrong side of bed. And, you know, that, and, and, you know a lot of times God's painted as, uh, you know, like the Greek gods. Anyone ever, you know, hear about the different Greek gods? And, and really, the, the, the problem and the flaw with the, their theology is the Greeks, they raised up their gods in the image of man. So the Greek gods had tempers, and they, they just, they could change their mind about things. They just were just, you know, they were like us, but just supernatural powers. Well, that's not the God that we serve. The God that we serve, the Bible says he changes not. Amen? And the Bible calls him the father of mercies. So we're going to be talking about that. See, mercy comes from the very heart of God. See, love is what motivated God to show Mercy to a lost and dying world. God is called the Father of mercies. That's who God is. I like what it says in Psalm 145, 8 and 9. It says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. I'm going to say that again. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. This is the God that we, we serve. This is the God of the Bible right here. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and great in mercy. Amen. The Lord is good to all, and His tender mercies are over all His works. Now, that is a beautiful picture of our Heavenly Father. It's a beautiful picture of His heart. He's actually, he's called the Father of Mercies. We'll be reading that in just a little bit. But, but you know, um, as a child, as, as I was growing up, my, my parents, they let me watch this, this movie. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys have ever heard of it. Uh, the Wizard of Oz. You ever hear of that one? I don't necessarily recommend it, but, but I, when I grew up, we grew up in, in a family. We, we weren't churchgoers, and my parents let us watch whatever we wanted to watch, basically. And... I can remember when Dorothy and her companions, they showed up in front of the Wizard of Oz. And we all know that it was a, a guy standing behind a curtain working dials and whatever, whatnot. But, but he, he, was, he addressed them in such a, 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 a mean voice and fire spewed everywhere. You know, what do you want? And, you know, it's like, ooh, you know, and, and, you know, the lion's freaking out, you know, because he had no courage. But, uh, you know, it, it was, you know, and that's, that, it just was just, you know, as a child watching it, I'm like, you know, like, whoa, you know, what is this? Well, a lot of times people picture God that way. They, they think that God is up there with a loud, angry voice, fire just exploding everywhere, you know, and, and, and someone's coming up to him real timidly, and, you know, I'm a sinner, what do you want, you know? Do you want mercy or what? Uh, you know, and I don't know that I would feel very comfortable going before a God like that. Well, a good news is our God isn't like that. Amen. Our God is a God of mercy. Yes. Our God is a God of love. And we're going to see that today. Amen. He's actually called the Father of mercy. Amen? Yes, amen. And so uh, we, we don't have to worry about the explosions and all that. See, see, the law, in the time of Moses, the law brought judgment. That's why we, we can see in the Old Testament that, that there was a lot of judgment going everywhere. The law actually brought that. But Jesus, when Jesus came, he brought the mercy of God. See, he, we got the mercy of God through Jesus Christ. Amen. It's a different situation. The Old Testament, 
there was no other option but, but punishment. Because there's the law, and if you don't obey the law, then there's the punishment. And there's nothing in between. There's no mercy in between. But when Jesus came, and He died on the cross for our sins, He changed the whole situation. We got a New Testament. Amen. We're not in the Old Testament anymore. We're not under the law anymore. We are under grace. Amen. We are under mercy. We are under love. Amen. Hallelujah. I, I like where, you know, the time that we're in much better. I wouldn't have wanted to really be you know, in the Old Testament. I would rather be in the New Testament because we have better promises. Amen. Amen. We, we, we have, everything's better on this side of the cross. Amen. 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 Everything is better. So the law brought judgment, but love brought mercy through Jesus Christ. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, starting at verse 18. Hebrews 12, 18. It says, I like this. I'm going to stress it right here. For you have not come. Okay? Why don't you just repeat that, after, repeat that after I say it. For you have not come. Right? Can you say that? For you have not come. Amen? That's, that's the part that I really want to stress. You have not come to this, but you've come to something else. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burns with fire and to the blackness and darkness and tempest. We have not come to that. And the sound of the trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard so, uh, so that those who heard it beg that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. We have not come to that. For they could not endure what was commanded. And so much so, and, and if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling. That is what we have not come to. Praise God. Is that a good thing? Amen. Now let's see what we've come to. Verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable, innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly, to the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to, the God, to, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. I love this. Verse 24. To Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. Amen. Amen. We're not under the old covenant. We're not under the, the fire and the wrath and all that. We are, we are coming to, we, we've come to a new one with Jesus, who is the mediator of a new covenant. And to the blood of the sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Amen. You know, the Bible says that when, when Abel was killed, that his blood spoke. Well, the Bible says that Jesus' blood speaks better things than Abel. What, what is Jesus' blood speaking? His blood is speaking righteousness. His blood is speaking life. His blood is speaking peace. The blood of Jesus is speaking redemption. Yeah. Amen? That's what Jesus' blood speaks. Speaks, And that's why we have all the blessings that we have in the Bible. Because we've come into something much better than what they had in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, they had the law, and they had the consequences. They had the law, and they had condemnation. In the New Testament, we have Jesus, and we have redemption. We have Jesus, and we have forgiveness. We have Jesus, and we have life. Now, if that doesn't get somebody excited, I, I don't know what, what else I could say. I mean, that's a pretty exciting thing. Amen? As Christians, as believers, we've come to something way better than what they had in the Old Testament. Amen. See, grace is getting something that you don't deserve. So, so you know, if, if you say you didn't work, but yet I gave you a paycheck, that would be grace. Because, you know, you didn't earn it. And it would be something good. So grace is getting something that you don't deserve. Something good that you don't deserve. 
And mercy is not getting the punishment that you do deserve. Now, who in here is perfect? Anyone? Oops. I better not put my hand up because ask my wife. She'll tell you I'm not perfect. Close. That's, oh, yeah, yeah. She's score, trying to score some points. Close. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, all of us, the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That, that the wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. I'll take the gift of God. Amen? Amen. I'll take the eternal life. Amen. And so, we, we're no longer, in the New Testament, we are no longer in, in, on a wage thing. The wages of sin is death. We are in the gift of God's eternal life. Amen? Amen. We've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Things got so much better when Jesus came along. Amen. Without Jesus, we were under the wrath of God. But, but with Jesus, we're under the mercy of God. And that was God's plan all along, that we would be functioning under the mercy of God. Sin brought wrath, but Jesus brought life. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. As a matter of fact, Jesus bore the wrath of God on himself so that we didn't have to bear that. So now we can come boldly to the very throne of grace. In Hebrews 4, verse 16, it says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Well, you know, we, that's, we come boldly to, before the throne of grace because that's what Jesus did. He, he made it that way. He made that path for us. We, we're, we have been washed in the blood of Jesus. When we come before God, God sees Jesus. We're part of his body. He's the head, and we are all the other parts of his body. Amen? He's the vine, and we're the branches. What, what flows through Jesus flows through his body. Amen? What flows through your head also flows through your body. Is that right? The same blood that flows through my head flows through my hands. It's circulating. Amen? Amen. Praise God. And so, you know, it's, you know, what a lot of people don't realize is what Jesus has done for us. He has blessed us so much. He, he's given us an inheritance. See, we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ Jesus. Joint heirs. In other words, what belongs to him belongs to us. It's, it's an incredible thing. We have so many treasures because of, G, because of what Jesus did. It's all about him. And so the Bible says that we can come boldly to the very throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. All of us will be going through times of need in our lives. The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. The Bible says that, that the righteous, you know, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the, but the Lord delivers us from them all. Amen? So, so all of those things we get delivered from. Amen. And so, you know, we, we need help. There's times when we need help. And so we, the beauty of it is we don't have to come in and be like trembling in, in all this. We can come in and be bold because of what Jesus did. We, we can go before God without any sin inferiority, without any sin consciousness. Because Jesus, he who knew no sin became sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God Amen. in Christ Jesus. When God sees us, he sees the righteousness yes. of God. That's what he's looking at. Well, that's why I can be bold. That's why I can, when I lay hands on someone, that's why I can believe God can use me. Why? Because I'm not seeing myself as a peasant, as a worm in the mud. I'm seeing myself as a son of God. Amen. An heir of God. Amen. And a joint heir with Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. So that, that changes everything. We need to get our minds renewed so that we get an understanding and a revelation of that. Amen. It's, it's, a, it's, it's so exciting. I mean, if you get a revelation, it just, it, it just blows your mind. Mm -hmm. We need our minds blown by the Word of God. Amen? Uh -huh. Amen. That way we get a new mind. Amen. Get our mind renewed. Some of us probably need our mind removed, right? <laughs> so, let's just get a brand new one. Amen. Get our minds on the, you know, the mind of Christ. Let's get the mind of Christ on. See, the, now, a beautiful picture of, you know, God's mercy would be Jesus. He, he walked in God's mercy. He showed God's mercy. Jesus revealed the compassion and mercy 
of our loving Heavenly Father. In John 14, 7, He says, If you had known Me, you would have known the Father also. Amen. See, Jesus was a perfect representation of the Father. And so, if you, if you really want to get a picture of what God looks like, look at the life of Jesus. Because Jesus displayed it. He said, if you've seen me, if you know me, then you know the Father. Amen. Uh, the Father and I, we, he said, I don't do anything unless I see the Father do it. I don't say anything unless I hear the Father say it. That's, that's Jesus. Jesus was the personification of God Almighty. Jesus is God in the flesh. That's what, that's what Emmanuel means. God with us. God in the flesh with us. Jesus represented God perfectly to a lost and dying world. Jesus is our example of God's mercy. In John, why don't we turn there real quick, John chapter 8. I think this is one of the, the greatest pictures of the mercy of God. Now we, we also have the other one with the, the prodigal son, which is an excellent one. And I, I use that quite often. It's a beautiful picture of God's mercy. But in John chapter 8, starting in verse 1, this is talking about the woman who was caught in adultery. It says here, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses, in the law, commanded that she should be stoned. But what do you say? See, they were trying to, to, to trick Jesus. Because Jesus, here Jesus teaching love and mercy and forgiveness. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Jesus is teaching all this, and now they're, they're bringing this woman who's caught in the very act of adultery. And, and the law says that woman should be stoned. You know what? Jesus didn't come here to enforce the law. Jesus came here to fulfill the law. And he fulfilled the law in himself. Hallelujah. Amen. And so... Uh, it's interesting though. The woman was brought before Jesus and she was caught in, the, in, in adultery, but where was the man at? Yeah. <laughs> where, where's the guy at in this situation? You know? Basically, this was a setup. They knew where they were going to be and they knew the, one, the guy and, and they let him get off scot free. And, and now they want to make an example out of this woman. You know, Jesus, God knows these things. God's not out there scratching his head and going, what am I going to do now? You know? And so, in verse 6 it says, This they said, testing him, that they might have something with which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. Now, there's, it doesn't tell us exactly what Jesus wrote. But, you know, you can think about maybe what he wrote. He could have been writing all the Ten Commandments right there. You know, one through ten. He could have wrote them all down and for, for them to see. Or he could have individually wrote out the sins of all the different scribes and Pharisees that came and, and said something to him. He wrote something on the ground. We don't know what it was. But, it, you know, it's just something to think about, you know. It's, I, I personally think Jesus, he, he, he was pretty personal. He probably just wrote down what they, their, their worst unknown sins. I don't know. Kind of interesting to think about, though. But the result that, that came about was pretty exciting. It says, so they continued asking him. He raised himself up and said, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. Now, the reason why the oldest one left first was he had lived on the earth long enough, he sinned more than all the rest of them. You know? So, so he had, there was an accumulation. 
And so, so the Bible says that he was the first one out, and then one by one, each one followed. And, Je and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And Jesus raised himself up and saw no one but the woman. And he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. That, that they left. There was no accuser anymore. You know, the Bible says out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Well, all the witnesses left. You know? <laughs> Their words meant nothing. <clears throat> She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again. He said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. This is the, such a beautiful picture. Jesus is showing us how much God loves us. How merciful. He, he's, he's displaying the, the mercy of God here. He's showing the world. This is the love of God. He didn't condemn her. As a matter of fact, Jesus said in John chapter 3, He says, I have not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might have life. The world might have life. Amen. Amen. God's not up there looking to condemn us. He's looking to you know, bring redemption to us. It's, that's why, you know, the ministry that we're called to is called the ministry of reconciliation. Amen? 2 Corinthians 5, you know, like 20 or around about in there, it says that, that we are called to the ministry of reconciliation. We're, we're, we're supposed to be saying, be reconciled to God. Amen? We're not supposed to be standing on sidewalks with, with signs saying, God hates you. You're all going to hell and there's no hope for you. That's not what we're to be doing. We're to be saying, God loves you. God so loved you that he sent Jesus to die for you. And if you put your faith in him, then you can have eternal life. That's the message of the gospel. Hallelujah. Jesus died for us so that we could live. It's, it's all about mercy. God, through Jesus, showed mercy to a lost and dying world. Jesus demonstrated the ultimate act of mercy when he went to the cross. For the sin of the whole world. Not half the world. Not just a, a certain select elect group. But everyone. Jesus died for the worst sinner. And he died for the, the best sinner. If there's anyone who qualifies as the best sinner. But you know. The best sinner that ever lived. Was still going to hell without Jesus. Amen. You know when, when I'm reaching out to people. When I'm sharing the gospel with them. And, and, and they say, well, you know, the reason why I, I should go to heaven is because I'm a good person. And, and you know, and then, then I start talking to them and saying, you know, that's not what will get you to heaven. Being a good person does not change your sin nature. Being, being a bad person doesn't change your sin nature. It's, your sin nature is, is the way we were born through Adam. In Adam, all die. And in Christ, all shall be made alive. So the only way to, to be made alive is to be in Christ. If any man be in him, he is a new creation. All things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. So you, you have to get into Christ, and that comes through faith in Christ. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then, then you, you, you change families, but you also change your, your, your spirit's nature. You become a new creation. Amen? You get into Christ. You're one in Him. Hallelujah. Isn't that awesome? Amen. And, and that's what Jesus, He demonstrated the mercy of God through His death on the cross. In Luke chapter 23, so a few verses right here, and, uh, and they should be up there. Luke chapter 23, this is when Jesus was on the cross. He was hung between two criminals. And these criminals were, were uh, Condemned to death. That's why they were on the cross beside him. And they deserved death. Whatever they did, they deserved it. These, these two criminals had no hope. They, they couldn't even fix what they did. They're put on the cross. There's no hope for them. No hope for any redemption for them. Nothing. They're, they're just paying the price for whatever they did wrong. You know, and really, that's the picture of us. 
They are a picture of the world. And, and the whole world, all of us, we're, we're deserving of death. All of us. It says, there were two others, criminals led with him to be put to death. The wages of sin is what? Death. death. The gift of God is what? Eternal life, Eternal life through Eternal Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus said that not about just those two criminals, but he said it about all those people that, that put him on the cross, all those people who lied when, when they were, you know, in trial, they, they lied about him, and uh, I lost my power. We gotta get new batteries, honey. Two weeks in a row. All right. God is good. Amen. Amen. Am I on? Hello. All right. So let me get back on my frame of thought. Jesus. He, he was the, the scapegoat. He was the one who took the sin of the world. And so, you know, the, the criminals were there, and, and really and truly, they represented us. Helpless, hopeless, and, you know, nothing that could be done for them. So Jesus, he, he, he said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Not just for the criminals, but also for the, all those who, who had, those who had plucked out his beard, those who had laid stripes on his back, those who had spit in his face, those who had mocked him, those who, who were, were taunting him, those who lied about him. Jesus was, was showing the mercy and the love of God to them. Amen? And so, uh, in verse 39 it says, Then one of the criminals who were, were hanged blaspheming him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing that you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly for, for we receive the due reward for our deeds. He recognized that he deserved what he was getting. But thank God that just because we deserve death, just because we deserve punishment, Jesus came and showed mercy to us. Amen. Amen. He, he goes on to say, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember, I love this, he called him Lord. He placed his faith in him. He believed that Jesus was innocent, that he was Lord, and that he was going to another kingdom. He said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, surely I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. This man could not correct his deeds. He could not correct those things that he did while he was placed on the cross. But the beautiful thing is he didn't have to. Jesus was bearing his sin on the cross. Jesus not only bore his sin, Jesus not only bore the sins of all those people who had, had done those things to him, but he bore the sin of the whole world. And not just the sin of the world at that time. He, he bore the sin of all those who've gone from the very beginning, from Adam on up to him, and from him to the very, very end. Jesus bore the sin of of all the world, of all time, once and for all. Amen. Now that's a pretty awesome thing. Amen. Wow. You know, he bore my sin. He also bore the most hideous people's sins. You know, it's Jesus paid the price for every sin. Everybody has an opportunity to go to heaven. The price has already been paid. The only thing they have to do is place their faith in him. There are people that are going to hell and the price has already been paid for them to go to heaven. And Jesus is the one. He said that, that you know, no one, He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through Him. He is the door. He is the only way. 
And, and, and God provided him. He is that life preserver. We were drowning in our sin. We were drowning out there with no hope. We were going down. And, and, and God tossed out Jesus to us. Amen? Amen. He, he, he sent Jesus to us. A lifeline to us. And the only thing we have to do is grab a hold of Amen. Jesus. Amen? By faith. Say, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I need you. I recognize I'm a sinner. And without me, or without you, I'm, I'm doomed. It's an awesome thing. And there's people that refuse, even though that, that life preserver, Jesus is our life, He preserved our life. Amen? He gave us life. Even though He's been furnished by God, He's been given to us from God, there are people who are still refusing to receive Him. And there are some people who don't even know. That's what we need to get out there and say, there's an answer for you, and His name is Jesus. Amen. 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 God is good. Amen. See, God is called the Father of mercies, and we are God, children of God's mercy and love. We, we are children of God's mercy and love. Hallelujah. See, He's the Father of mercies, and we're children of mercies. In 2 Corinthians 1, 3, 3 and 4, it says, Blessed be the God and our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation, in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. There, there are people that need the comfort of God. And we can give it to them. We can share it with them. We've been blessed. We've been given mercy. So we can extend the mercy of God to them. We, God calls us ministers of reconciliation. Hallelujah. Amen. Reconciling the world to Him. He did it through Jesus, and He wants to do it through us by, by sharing what Jesus did. Amen. It says, Who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. <laughs> That's our God. Amen. He's the comforter. He's the Father of mercies. It doesn't matter what you've done. God loves you. It doesn't matter what you've done. If you think that there is no forgiveness for you, the Bible says there's forgiveness, and it's in Jesus. Amen? Amen? Amen. There's forgiveness because it's in Jesus. And when you become a child of God, you become also a child of love. The love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. We have the love of God. We just have to let it out. Amen? Let the love of God out. Stir up love. Stir up good deeds. Stir ourselves up to, to, to do the works of Jesus. In Luke 6, 36 and 37, it says, Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father is also merciful. Amen? Our Father is merciful, so He wants His children to be merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. I just love that. You know, um, I've seen people who are pretty good at forgiving when it comes to, to people that are outside of the family. I've seen husbands and I've seen wives that are real easy to forgive just anyone else. But when it comes to one another, they, it's like it doesn't exist. They, they, they have this long list of offenses. Long grocery list. See, unforgiveness is the number one thing that, that will destroy a, a marriage. That will destroy a family. We've got to have the mercy of God in our lives. We've got to have the mercy of God in our marriages. I've, seen, I've been in marriage counseling. And, and, and sometimes I felt like a referee because... You know, it's just going back and forth. There, you know, so so says, well, he did this, 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 and that to me. And then, and then the husband goes, yeah, but she did this, 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 and that to me. And it's just a vicious, it's a vicious circle. You know, you, my wife, she, she didn't treat me right, so, you know, I'm justified to not treat her right. Or vice versa. My husband didn't, didn't treat me right, so, you know, so I don't have to show him love. I don't have to... Here, here's the thing. The answer is this. 
If you want love, you've got to sow love. Even if the other person isn't sowing that love back, continue to sow love. You can do it because God has put that love in you. Yes. Amen. Amen? And what will happen is God will begin to, to deal with that person and, and they'll, they'll be convicted. It'll be like putting hot coals on their head when you do good things like that. See, the, the answer is doing the opposite. If someone's treating you bad, the Bible says, bless those who what? Curse you. Love your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you. That What happens is it puts God, it gets God involved in the process. Instead, I've seen in marriages, I've seen a vicious cycle. She, she treated me bad, so I'm going to treat her bad. Or he's treated me bad, so I'm going to treat him bad. And so then, so then the other side, you know, they're both treating each other bad. Why? Because the other one did it last. It's, it's like a vicious cycle. It's, it's horrible. And, and it will destroy relationships. It destroys marriages. It destroys families. It destroys friendships. It brings destruction. So, so God wants us to, to walk in mercy. We've, we need to be merciful, full of mercy, loving people, you know, forgiving people. Jesus said that, you know, one of his disciples came to him and said, you know, how many times, Master, do I need to forgive someone in a day? Up to seven times? And Jesus said seven times seven. Wow. That's in one day. And, and if we're not allowed to keep track of them, then you can't even be counting in the first place. You know, and, and here's the thing. God would not expect us to be that way unless God's that way himself. See, see, love, the Bible says that love does not keep a record of all the wrongs. 1 Corinthians 13. It doesn't keep a record of all, a list of all the wrong things. That, you know, I've seen, you know, where you've done marriage counseling and, and they have it clear back from like, you know, the second day that they were married to 20 years. They have a list. I mean, long list. That's, I, I, I mean, I would rather be, you know, um, forgetful. Amen. Do you realize how much energy? Some people, they don't even know their phone numbers, but they know every offense that's ever done. You know? Or they don't know their, sp their spouse's phone number, but they know every offense. You know? it's, it's bad. We've got, we've got to walk in love. We've got to show the mercy of God. Amen? Amen. Don't let the devil in your life. When you don't show mercy, you're opening up the door for the devil. And we're almost done here. The, you know, it says in, in Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, it says, Be angry and do not sin. You can be angry and still not sin. It's not easy, but it's possible. You know, we never get angry, do we, honey? Yeah. <laughs> Hey, let's put, don't answer, don't answer that, okay? Um, here, here's the thing. There is no such thing as a perfect marriage. But, but you can have a healthy marriage. Amen? And the reason why there's no such thing as a perfect marriage is because you've got two imperfect individuals in that marriage. You know, two imperfect individuals, you're never going to have a perfect marriage. But, but when you walk in God's love and when you walk in the mercy of God... You can have a healthy marriage. You can have disagreements, but, but they don't have to get ugly. That's right. Amen? That's right. they, they, they might get loud, but they don't have to get ugly. Hallelujah. That's true. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Smoking from the wife who says that I'm almost perfect. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, Lord, help me. All right. But, uh, but you know, the Bible says that, that we can be angry, but don't sin. It says, do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. And that's what unforgiveness does. That's what unresolved issues does. It, it opens up a door for the devil to come in and do surgery on you. I don't want the devil to come in and do malpractice on my wife and I's marriage. That's why when, when you have a disagreement, you need to get it resolved before you go to bed at night. Don't go to sleep. Until you get it fixed. That's what Norma and I, all these years, it's been very few times that we've ever broke that rule. Where, where we were angry 
and we went to bed that way. Very, very few. I don't even remember when. I mean, and, and you know, I'm not saying that we're perfect. I'm not, and I'm not condemning you if you have done that. What I'm saying is that if you do do that, you're opening up the door of the enemy in your life. Don't give place to the devil. You know, it's sort of like this. When, when you lay cement out, it, as long as that cement's there, it, it, it will begin to, to get solidified. It'll get hard. And, and it's sort of like this. If, if you have a disagreement with your spouse, then if you wait overnight, what happens is it becomes more concrete. It becomes more solid. So, so you know, it's easy to wash fresh concrete off than it is to after it's already gotten solid. Now you got issues. Now you got some strong problems. Let, let's deal with our problems before they become something really ugly. Amen? Let's get healed. Ephesians 4, verse 31. And we're going to go to, to verse 5, uh, 2. It says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ in God, I mean, even as God in Christ forgave you. Even as God in Christ forgave you. Well, how did God forgive you? Jesus loves us so much. He loves us what? I, I would put both my hands apart like that. Amen? In other words, He loves us that much. He went to the cross for us. Amen. Jesus willing to give His life for us. So what this is saying is we should be willing to give our life for our spells. So, you know, if I'm willing to give my life for Norma, then that really makes any other little argument that we have pretty minute or stupid. Anyone here ever have a stupid argument? I'm not the only one who's ever had one of those. All right. And, and then when you're done with it, and after you've made up, then you're like, man, that was really stupid. You know, why did we even argue about that? It didn't change anything anyhow. Hello? And, and so, you know, here's, you know, the, the biggest point is this, that if you're willing to give your life for that person, then there's nothing that you can't forgive that they do. Because it's, everything else is on the table. Hallelujah. This tells us in, in uh, the fifth chapter, verse one, it says, be imitators of God as dear children. We are the children of God. The Bible tells us to be imitators of Him. We're supposed to imitate Him. It says, and walk in love. So, we're, that's how we're supposed to imitate God. If you want to be an imitator of God, then be a person who walks in the love of God. Walk in love with your spouse. Walk in love with your children. Walk in love with your friends and family. Walk in love with with your enemies. That, that's, there's only one way you can do that, and that's by God's strength. It's by the love of God that has been put in your heart. It's by agape love, the God kind of love. And if you're a born-again Christian, you have that love. You just need to tap into it. It says, walk in love. As Christ also loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God, for a sweet smelling aroma. And that's what, when we walk in love, that's what it smells like to God. A sweet smelling aroma. A sweet smelling atmosphere. Have you ever walked into a room where someone had just put perfume on or something? And it's just, you can smell it, it's strong. Anybody ever do that? Well, that's what love smells like to God. I wonder what the opposite smells like to God. You know? Or, have you ever walked in a situation... Because we're talking about environment, right? You walk into a, a, a situation that's charged with words of anger and resentment and arguing. You, you can walk in it and you, you don't even have to know what they were talking about. But you know that something just took place there. There was just an ugly argument and you're like, eh, I think I'll you know, go somewhere else. Because that's what our, our words and our actions and our attitudes... That's, that's, they give off uh, uh, a flavor or a fragrance. 
And, uh, you know, God wants us to be wearing His favorite fragrance. He wants us to be wearing love. Amen. Amen. He wants us to, to, to be carrying that love everywhere we go. The love of God just permeating off of us. See, that's how they know that we, we're His disciples. Why? Because we have love for one another. That's the only picture, that's the only credential right there. Love one for another. If you have the love of God and you're living in the love of God, then, then you are displaying God to the world. You're carrying Him out to the world. That's, that's what brings people to repentance. It's the goodness of God that brings people to repentance. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God is the God of mercies. Amen. We are children of mercies. We have the mercy of God upon our lives, and we should be extending that mercy out to everyone we see. Hallelujah. That's why it's called forgiveness. Because it's an attitude that we have. It, we, it's ahead of time. You already have the attitude, I'm a forgiving person. I've already, I'm extending it out before someone even offends me. There's forgiveness. You're giving it, and you're giving it ahead of time. Amen. Forgiveness. Amen? And that, that's the attitude. When you're walking in the love of God, you're going to be walking in the forgiveness of God. You're going to be walking in the mercy of God. And the world will know that you're different. They'll know you're different than the rest of them. Because the world is, you know, a tooth for a tooth, an eye for an eye. Uh, you know, you hit me, I'll hit you back. That's the way the world thinks. That's the way they function. And, and God's saying, no, turn the other cheek. Forgive, love. And it, sometimes I, I think it's just easier for us to do that to everyone else except for our spouses. And it should be the opposite. Our spouses are our best friends. Our spouses are the ones that we, we, we're in covenant with. Our spouses are the ones that, that we made a promise to, that we are going to just love them. And, you know, remember this? People who have been married for a while, you know, for better or for worse, you know, sometimes there's better and sometimes there's worse, but you still got to love. Amen? It's the love of God. It's a sweet smelling aroma. You want your house. You know, I see people all the time. They're putting all these plug-ins and stuff all through their house. They want everyone to know that their house smells good, right? <laughs> well, well, you know, that's the way our life should be. We should be like, you know what? I'm plugged into the love of God. I mean, I just want people to know that I'm I'm walking in the love of God everywhere I go. And, and people would be embarrassed if they if someone came to their house and the house stunk. You know, your house is, you know, I don't think anybody would be rude enough to say that, but, you know, your house just really stinks. Well, you know, if we have the love of God in our lives, and we're, we're walking in that love, then, then people will be wanting to be around us. They're going to want to be around us. They're going to be like, wow, you know, that smells good. Uh, you know, where did you get that at? I know Norma, she's, she's gone up to women before, and she's like, she, you know, she's like, you know, you smell great. Where did you buy that? You know, I, I want to get some of that. You've done that a few times. And, uh, you know, that's the way it's supposed to be with us. People smell the love of God. It's a, it's a sweet-smelling aroma. And they're like, wow, I've never smelled anything like that before. Where can I get some of that? And that's a perfect opportunity to share Jesus Christ with them. To be a witness. Amen? See, our Heavenly Father is good and full of mercy. He is the Father of mercies and all comfort. Since we are God's children, let's show the world God's love and forgiveness. Amen? Let's demonstrate the love of God to the world. Let's be children of mercy. Because we have a God of mercy. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for each person here. I thank you, Lord, that you are the Father of mercies. I thank you, Lord, that that you have changed our lives and you've helped us, Lord. And we're children of mercy, hallelujah. I thank you, Lord, for the love of God that, that, that has been shed abroad in our hearts, Father. Help us to, to share that mercy. Lord, we thank you for that. We give you all the praise, honor, and glory for it. In Jesus' precious name. Before you shut that off, uh, I just want everybody to bow your heads and close your eyes. If there is anyone here who has never invited Jesus Christ to come into your heart, to be your Lord and Savior. I want to give you an opportunity now to receive Him. Because He is the only answer. The mercy 
that, that you need is, is going to come through Him. So if there's anyone here who has never received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I just want you to raise your hand so I can pray for you. If there's anyone here who's never done that, you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart to be your Lord and Savior. If there's anyone here who's never done that, you raise your hand and we'll pray for you. This is your opportunity. Hallelujah. Your opportunity to, to become a new creation in Christ. Brand new. Let me just pray for everyone. Lord, I just thank you. I thank you for each person here today. And Lord, I thank you for those who are watching on the internet as well. And Father, if, if they have not received you as their Lord and Savior, we're going to pray this prayer. And just repeat that prayer after me if you've never asked Jesus into your heart. Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father I, know I know that I'm a sinner. And I need a Savior. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I ask Him to come into my life to change me forever, to make me a new creation. I thank You, Father, for eternal life through Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. God is good. If you prayed that prayer, then welcome to the family. Amen? And God bless you. And you've gotten to partake of the Father of mercies. God is good. Amen? We love you and God bless you. All right.